Could this really be the most effective method you can use to acquire new clients and make sales virtually in the COVID-19 era? Patrick Galvin, CEO of The Galvanizing Group and best-selling author of The Connector's Way, says absolutely yes. Um, as business people, and this is great advice right now, we've all been dealt a hand. It may be good, it may be bad, uh, somewhere in between during COVID. We can't control the hand that we've been dealt in many ways because it's just the nature of our industry. But we can control what we do. And in every single industry, there will be people who not only survive, but thrive. So if you just focus in on what can I do to thrive, and I don't have the answer for you because it's going to vary from industry to industry. If you just focus in on the inputs and worry less about the outputs and you have quality inputs, you just have to trust that a process of quality inputs is going to come out with a quality output for you. I'm Ken Newhouse. Building a profitable business isn't only about generating leads and driving sales. It's about who we are and what we're made of. It's about finding the most effective methods to persuade, inspire, and ignite the imagination of others so you can succeed in business. If you're a member of the new breed of entrepreneur, I invite you to join the quest as we reveal the newest and most effective methods you can use to get clients now. Everybody knows that most businesses have been forced to sell virtually due to COVID. But are you falling behind because you haven't figured out how to make it work for you? Does the thought of reaching out to prospective clients on social platforms feel awkward, high pressure, and salesy to you? When you meet with prospective clients virtually, are you having difficulty figuring out how to set an effective emotional tone for the call? When you're on virtual calls with prospects, are you forcing them to engage with you, or are you losing them because your calls are one-sided where you're doing most, if not all, of the talking? Are you missing opportunities and losing sales because you're afraid to ask prospects to schedule a sales presentation or worse, afraid to ask for the sale during your calls? If you answered yes to any of those questions, and if those scenarios are similar to what you've experienced, today's episode is going to transform your ability to connect with prospects and make more sales virtually. And by the end of today's show, 100% of the uncertainty and fear you have about doing business virtually is going to be eliminated. I'm your host, Ken Newhouse, and I want to welcome you to episode 377 of the Get Clients Now podcast. My guest today is Patrick Galvin, CEO of The Galvanizing Group and best-selling author of the book, The Connector's Way, a story about building business one relationship at a time. Everybody knows that strong relationships are the key to personal and professional success. And on today's episode, you're going to learn a framework that allows you to create and build relationships consistently and effectively with both prospects and clients. On this episode of the Get Clients Now podcast, Patrick Galvin is going to uncover powerful relationship building secrets that make you magnetically attractive to your prospects and clients, making the sales process almost effortless. Ironically, Galvin discovered these methods after making a $150,000 advertising blunder. Yes, I said that right. $150,000 advertising blunder, a mistake that nearly cost him everything. And while many of these strategies are hiding, quote unquote, in plain sight, it's possible that they've been eluding you. Galvin is also going to reveal seven simple yet powerful rules for building your business. So whether you're looking for a consistent way to attract prospects and make sales virtually, today's interview will galvanize you into action and provide a clear path to success. How you doing? Hey, Ken. Great to talk to you. I've been excited about this. I have been as well. So Patrick is up in the beautiful city of Portland, Oregon, where the beautiful and talented Lisa and I used to live. And the thing I miss most about Portland, besides it's just stunning, I'm going to tear up when I say this, Powell's City of Books. So please tell me that Powell's is still intact. It is still intact. Uh, and they are figuring out a way to hold their own in a very tough environment for bookstores these days. Patrick, one of the questions that I love to start my interviews with And I think this gives the person listening to the show a good feel for who you are, where you're coming from, where you've been, where you're going. But if you could take two or three minutes, give us your backstory, bring us up to speed for the interview. Well, I am a a person that has always enjoyed people. I'm a a, a classic extrovert people person. I went to school, uh, went to business school, and I was taught that business is not so much a people thing. It's a marketing and finance and statistics. And when I came out into the work world, I had forgotten my people skills, honestly, and I was focused in on what I had learned in business school. 
But what I experienced was it's not about the things you learn in business school. It's about the connections and relationships that you build. So after doing a lot of things wrong, and we can get into details about that if you'd like, I really started to focus in on what was allowing some people to succeed, why others flailed. And what I found is that the good relationship builders, regardless of whether they sold a product or service, and no matter what their industry was, those were the high performers. And people who were trying to game their way to the top don't succeed. They may get short-term success, but at the end of the day, when push comes to shove, it's that ability to create rapport and relationship that is really going to be the basis of a sustainable business. And that has been the basis of my business for the last 18 years. So the Galvanizing Group is my company, and we help businesses grow through better relationships. All right. So one of the other questions that I love to ask, and I, I think I want to put a little bit of a different spin on this just for the sake of maybe having a little fun with it. One of the questions I'd love to ask is what's something about you that people in the marketplace, even your clients typically don't know about you, but you'd like them to know, but I'm going to put a little spin on this. What's something silly about Patrick Galvin that most people, even your clients maybe don't really know about you. That's kind of fun, kind of goofy, whatever it is, just to kind of lighten the mood today for the show. Well, very few people know that uh, in 1984, Myself and a friend of mine broke the Guinness World Record for hammock swinging. We were in a hammock for eight days. Uh, we did it as a publicity stunt for my dad's hammock stores. Uh, this is back in San Francisco, California, which gives it some context. And it was a fun experience and taught me the value of doing things differently. My dad was not on the tip of people's tongues, but that hammock record got people noticing the store and noticing his business. And it really opened my eyes to the power of publicity and just doing things a slightly offbeat to draw positive attention. That is absolutely amazing. I think you're the first official person I've had that's a Guinness Book of World Record holder. Are you still the reigning world record champion for hammock swings? No, here's the thing. We were dethroned a couple of years later by two kids in Texas who broke our swinging record. So we had the record for the most time swinging. And these kids, actually, they were the real deal because they broke our record in playground swings. I have no idea if they tied themselves to their swings, how they pulled it off. But no, we lost our record to them. That's a heartbreak. What a heartbreak. <laughs> so Patrick, you've got you and the Galvanizing Group, you have a reputation. And I think it goes well without saying that you have a tremendous reputation in the corporate industry, as well as with individuals with your online system coaching program, which is really kind of a self-guided coaching program. But also you've got a coaching program that's designed for executives. You have a tremendous reputation of really being able to transform a business, whether it's, you know, a $50 million corporation, even a small business. But what is the thing that you find most rewarding, whether you want to talk about it from the side of the corporate side or the individual side, most, I will say, probably 80% of the people that listen to the show. So eight out of 10 people listening right now are probably self-employed. There is a 20% dental industry percentage of people who listen to the show who are C-suite people. What do you find most rewarding about the work that you do, really transforming businesses and helping them when it seems that no one else is able to? What I love about my work is relationship building is a mindset. So if you buy into this mindset that success is predicated on your ability to, to build strong relationships, then you can logically make the jump into saying, OK, well, I'm going to work on that skill set. And the cool thing about the skill set of relationship building, I'm hired by companies for coaching. And we coach in small groups and what we call connecting cohorts, groups of six. Companies pay the bill because they know that it's going to take their teams to higher levels of relationship building. That's going to drive more repeat business, more referred business. But here's the great thing about relationship building. When you practice it in the business setting and you really buy into it and you work on your skills to become a better business connector, more often than not, it'll carry over into personal relationships. And that, for me, is super rewarding. It's sort of the hidden upside of, of our work is there's a lot of coaching that you can do that doesn't necessarily translate into a better personal life. But whether it's with your spouse, whether it's with your kids, with your friends, we live in a society that's very individualistic. And the core of what makes a good relationship builder is getting outside your own shoes to understand your customer. But likewise, we need to, we need to understand our spouses. We need to understand our kids. We need to understand our friends. So if we work at it, in the business world, and we can kind of get out of our own heads, we can do a much better job of doing that with the folks who are important to us. So that's a huge upside for me. Yeah, that's one of the questions that actually is part of one of the questions I'm going to ask you in just a bit. 
is that, you know, your book gave advice, gave instruction, just amazing. And a very short book. I will say that we talked about that earlier, not just for business, but for life in general, that I found very refreshing. And certainly, uh, you know, my philosophy is, and I learned this a long time ago from Mino Dan, if I get one thing out of a book or a seminar that I can turn around and monetize or use in a very beneficial way that's going to help me or help me to help my clients or my members, I'm all for it. I'm stoked. And I can honestly say that I probably learned five or six really solid strategies. A couple of me brought, you know, like stirred up my mind to start doing them again. But I was amazed that you were able to cram so much valuable content in a short book like this that anybody could read in, what, 90 minutes? If they're a slow reader, maybe 90 minutes. It's a 90 minute read that was intentionally done. So there's power in the 100 pages. Uh, 90 minutes is a lot of time for a lot of, for many folks, 65% of all adults will not read a book this year in our country, which is a sad statement. But if you write a book that's short, you've got a fighting chance to have your book be one of the only ones that perhaps they finish this year. And if you get someone to finish your book, your chances of someone actually recommending it, and this has been proven in a lot of different studies, is astronomically higher. So I think the publishing industry needs to wake up to the reality that most people don't have the time. And honestly, most books, if you gave it to a good editor, benefit by having 30 to 50% cut to really hone in on the core message. Yeah, that's one of the things I told Patrick. I said, listen, man, you have a talent for being able to pack unbelievable value into a bite-sized book and eliminate all the bloat. I didn't have to wade through any bloat or any muck. This was just like constant value bombs going off as I'm reading this. I found it very refreshing, like I said. So one of the things I, I love to ask because of the people that we interview on here, probably I'm somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 to 270 authors who have written books. And I would say from that group, 100 of them have really been top sellers in a particular category. So they truly are best selling authors. One of the questions that I love to ask, just for my curiosity, and I know the person listening to the show probably likes it as well, but what were you doing and where were you when the spark, you know, the idea for the connector's way like went off in your head. You're like, I have to write this book. I have to write it. Where were you and what were you doing? Well, I was very frustrated because I had about 10 pages completed in a nonfiction handbook about business relationship building. And that was sitting around just kind of adding paragraphs here or there over the course of a couple of years. And then I realized that if I was bored with my own book, it didn't bode well for the future. And I started thinking about how I learn and what I enjoy. Uh, one of your past guests, uh, Bob Berg, great guy, was an inspiration for me. And Bob is in that genre that my book is in, which is the parable. And it's Bob, Patrick Lencioni, who I've had a chance to meet before, great guy. Uh, Og Mandino, who's a classic writer. There's so much power in story. And I thought, well, wait a second, why am I trying to force my expertise into a nonfiction book? Is it going to make me look smarter? Is it ego that's doing it? If I read stories and enjoy them, why can't I take what I have to share and put it into a story? And that was sort of a slow process of realization. It was uh, just coming to terms with, well, who am I trying to impress here? And stories and parables, the greatest thing about them compared to other types of books is they have a very long tail. So if you write the latest and greatest social media platform that one should be using or how to use it, it's going to lose relevance the day it's in print versus you have a story with classic truths, it's going to maintain its relevance for a much longer period of time. Yeah, it's going to have a lot more traction over a longer period of time. So, you know, you just mentioned the word relevance, which ironically is one of the words in my next question. So oh, we've got a ton of people that due to no fault of their own are struggling because of COVID, we've had a small percentage of members actually go out of business and due to no fault of their own. So this is certainly not a critique of them in any way, shape or form. I feel for them. You have others that are really, really struggling. You have others that their growth has just literally stopped. And then you have a handful of people, a small, minute group of people who are literally thriving. So let's just shelve the thrivers for just a moment. And then I want you to take us from a 30,000 foot view of your book and give us the big overarching picture. Obviously, even though it's a short book, there is absolutely no way unless we were here for a week that we could go through all the good, valuable content that's in your book. That's not going to happen. So if we could... What's the one primary, hey, this is what the book's about, and here's how it's going to help you. And then taking it one step further, what would you say to the person who's struggling right now? Their business is, you know, they're making it, but it's a fight for sure. 
The thing that really resonated with me and really struck me is that, hey, this is a book that people, it'll help them right now. And in fact, it is helping a lot of people. And that's another thing that I thought was very refreshing. I was, I was real pleased with that. But for that person who's listening, who may be struggling right now, that's the kind of the follow-up part of the question. How is your book going to help them get through and actually start to actually do better than they're doing now due to COVID? Well, I think there's tremendous opportunities right now. And I consider myself really lucky that I was in a chair when the music stopped. That's kind of what I like into the COVID environment. A lot of people congratulate themselves for their success. I think of it more as musical chairs. You know, the economy was coming along. All of a sudden, things change. And maybe you were in an industry or you were doing things that actually could draft off of these new conditions, which is the situation I'm in. And the way I think it's benefited us is when people think about what has gotten them to be successful in business and you start asking questions about where their referrals come from, you know, what are the core sort of drivers for their business? A lot of people can sit back and start thinking, you know, these relationships, I, I have a lot of relationships, but it's not the 5,000 friends on Facebook that drive my business. It's this core and it could be three to five people, maybe 10. It's not a ton of people. Now, perhaps some of those folks are no longer in a position to send business your way. But if you believe in this notion of relationship will drive your success, you have now opportunities to go in deeper with existing relationships or maybe lean into relationships that you sort of left by the wayside. And my basic starting point is it's all about service. You know, if you're going to be delivering value, you really have to be of service to people before you think about how you're going to extract benefit. And right now, it's in many ways easier than ever to be of service because people in many states are now in lockdown environments. They're not able to meet with their customers or with their prospects or with their referral partners. Or if they can, it's difficult and some people don't want to you know, meet face to face. And if you can just take time to connect with people, look at your LinkedIn connections, look at your first degree connections, see people that maybe have passed business along to you in the past or people who you'd like to do business with and take advantage of this time to use the technology we're on right now, Zoom or some other video conferencing and say, let's get together for 15 minutes and just reconnect or connect for the first time if it's been a long time and just take time to really be where they are. For me, it's a lot of rapport building around uh, I'm in a homeschooling adventure that we never anticipated. And I'm connecting with a lot of people and just reconnecting with friends saying, hey, how's the homeschooling going for you? It's a struggle for people who haven't done it before. So we'll talk about non-business things for the first five minutes of our 15-minute virtual coffee. And then inevitably, hey, Patrick, what is your business these days? What are you focused on? And I've gotten more business in the last three months from 15-minute virtual coffees than I ever imagined possible. And I didn't do it for business. I had time. And I'll be honest with you, I wanted to connect with more people because I'm an extrovert. And this has been just an incredibly fruitful time for my business. So I think it's something that most of your listeners could possibly adopt. That's good. So in the book, the protagonist is Robert. And there are mentors, I'll call mentors, people who influence him and give him direction and give him really good ideas. But for you, and this is for you personally, what's the one super cool above all the rest? And there's some big value in this book, some really awesome ideas. For you personally, Patrick, which one? And obviously, you created all of this out of thin air, but what's the one super cool strategy or idea that Robert got from someone in the book that somebody can apply today that, you know, the person listening right now, the man or woman, professional, the corporate person, whoever they may be, where they're going to go, wow, what a great idea. I could do that now. And you just kind of talked about yeah. reaching out to people, but from the book, what do you think? Well, first of all, let me just explain that uh, I'm really not a novelist by nature. So everything in that book is something that either happened to me, a client or a friend, and I just changed the names to protect my relationships. There you go. But all those characters, and sometimes I just changed the last name because I wanted the person to know that I was calling them out. So uh, there's a lot of credit due to, to some great relationship builders. I, in many senses, am Robert because I've been mentored over the years. Uh, so best piece of advice, it's really the overarching message. So there's seven rules that, that Robert learns by the end of the book, and he connects with things that he had discounted, uh, such as rotary clubs, chambers of commerce, these community-based activities. It's just when he had money in his budget to do that, that was great. But when times got tough for his insurance agency, that's his business, uh, he cut those out. And he was in those organizations to extract benefit before. And because he had that mindset, they weren't doing much for him. So they were easy things to cut. 
Well, some of his mentors reintroduce him to those groups, and he goes in with their guidance with a different mindset. And it's the mindset of how do I serve the organization? You know, in the case of a chamber, you become an ambassador. In the case of a rotary club, you get on one of the boards, maybe community grants, maybe some other cause for the board. And the thing is, people want to do business with folks who they feel connected to, who they have relationships of trust with. When you're in these organizations, you have an opportunity to build those relationships of trust. And if you're in there immediately trying to monetize that organization, it's just going to be a complete waste of time. You're going to burn your bridges. You could actually do the opposite. So it happens multiple times to Robert that he really sees the light, that it's all about giving. And whether it's Rotary, whether it's a chamber, whether it's a professional association, and so many people just don't get that. And they get so frustrated saying, none of these groups work. Well, usually you just need to look in the mirror. You know, that's probably one of the best lessons that I've learned, and I don't remember who I learned it from, is to not, whether I'm going to go talk to a prospective joint venture partner, whether I'm going to talk to a prospective client or whoever it is, never go with an open hand expecting to get from the person you're talking to. Always have something in your hand, metaphorically speaking, that you can give to that person to create or deliver value first. That's a really good way to build a relationship of trust is that you're delivering before you're asking for anything in return and not necessarily even asking directly. So it's not like you're, hey, I'm going to be real sly about this. Let me give them this and then I'm going to obligate them to give me what I want. That's not what we're talking about here. And I thought you did a really artful job. And speaking about your seven rules for building business, one relationship at a time, the list at the end of the book, obviously we're not going to cover all seven, but I want you to take maybe two, maybe three. Tell us what they are. Two is probably good. And tell us why they're so important and actually very, very impactful. So if people go to the list and they look at those, the first five things in there are really under the heading of being of service to others. So it's serving others without consideration for how you're going to benefit, exceed what they might expect of someone who's doing that. You know, be creative. Um, they're all related to this notion of sort of the, 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 the one who gives before they get. Now, if I were to say, if, if I were to write that book and just say, do these five things and your business is going to flourish, that would be disingenuous. A lot of people really do have a service mindset, yet they are not successful in business. So the final two rules are essential. And they have to, have to do with once you have created this foundation of helping other people in a genuine way, people want to reciprocate. I know you've, in the past, you've had folks talking about Robert Cialdini and his book, Influence. And he has this wonderful section in his book where he talks about the law of reciprocity. Human beings are wired to give back. But here's the thing. We all are so darn busy that unless we're prompted to give back, we don't necessarily do it. 50% of all people, in order to make a referral, have to be asked for one. And that's not putting it in your email signature line. That's having a conversation. Now, if you do the ask before you've done the service, it's not going to work for you. But if you've done the service, You've got to have those conversations. And I'm really talking about conversations, talking to people and helping them. And people want to help you back and they need to be directed because they're busy. So ask for something that that person is capable of. If you're a dentist, let's say, and you don't have a lot of Yelp reviews, or maybe you have some negative ones because you had a disgruntled patient go in there and post a negative one. You can't get that negative one to disappear. Yelp won't take it down, but you could subsume negativity with positivity. The solution to pollution is dilution. So then go to your patients who are happy with your services because you're probably surveying them or you just know because of what they've told you or what they've told your staff members and say, hey, you know what? We have loved having you as a client and we're not as big as that dentist clinic, that dental clinic across town, but we would just really appreciate if you could take a moment and pop on a Google review or a Yelp review and let them know that it's important to you. And when you have had that relationship with them of being of service, people are going to be happy that they can finally give back to you because you've been such a great dentist for them over the decades. Like, you've got to ask. You've got to ask. So that's the sixth rule. And then the seventh rule is if you are growing through letting people know how they can help you succeed, which is the sixth rule, the seventh one is, is key. It's like, have a methodology of gratitude. This seems so simplistic, but there are so many people who don't get a continuous stream of opportunities to grow their business because they're not outwardly showing gratitude to those who are helping their businesses take off. You know, there's a four letter word that comes to mind 
Patrick, as we have our conversation. It's not a bad four letter word. <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> it's the word work. It's the word. It's not another four letter word, but how about take taking action? So I know the tendency because I've had it myself, especially when I was recovering from COVID, I just had this total apathetic state where I didn't even want to do my podcast anymore, even though I got a top ranked podcast. I was like, I don't want to do anything anymore. And then as part of being sick, but I know a lot of people who are struggling and they've said to me, you know, maybe I should just quit and think about something else going to get a job. Well, going to get a job right now is probably not the easiest thing. If you really love what you do and you're serving people and you're helping them, I think it's a good idea. And so I just wanted to throw this one little suggestion and you have to be willing to do the work. This takes action. And so it's not hard if you're genuinely, as Patrick mentioned, trying to connect and help and serve people, they're going to receive you nine times out of 10 or eight times out of 10 with open arms. And it's just a very small group of people who, if you genuinely help them, are they're, they're like parasites who they're only takers. We're all going to encounter people like that in life. And you have to under, go into this knowing some people are going to, you're going to help them and they're not going to, even if you prompt them, they're not going to be willing to, you know, retroactively help you in return. They're just not, it's a very yeah. small percentage. So don't, don't let the knowledge, if that's happened to you, it's happened to me. Don't let that jade you on following what Patrick has given you. Uh, and again, let me do this very quickly so I will remember to do it. As with every guest on the show, Patrick's book. Patrick, tell us the name of your book, the full title. It is The Connector's Way, a story about building business one relationship at a time. Okay. And so that book is 100% guaranteed. You're going to buy the book. You're going to read it put it into action. You're going to benefit beyond your wildest expectations. Am I telling you you're going to make $100,000 over the next six months because you read Patrick's book? I'm not telling you that, but I am telling you that it will be worth multiples of multiples of your, what is it? A dollar, five bucks? It's like, it's like pennies. It's incredibly cheap. I mean, it's 10 bucks, maybe at the most, but more importantly, the time it takes to read. So 90 minutes, if somebody books 90 minutes with me, I mean, that's a couple thousand bucks. And so that's a lot of my time. And I know that's your time as well. And so as a result, I don't recommend books lightly. And I don't have people on the show that I can't guarantee what it is they're promoting. I'm gonna do that with this coaching program as well. I'm going to guarantee it. the coaching program is going to be a little different. So you're going to benefit, like I said, or email me at customer service at kennewhouse.com. I'll reimburse you for the book. Now the coaching, which we'll cover at the end, but I'll just throw this in. Robert's going to hold your feet or excuse me, Patrick's going to hold your feet to the fire. There are going to be steps you have to take. So if you take his individual kind of self-guided coaching program, but you don't implement, I'm not going to guarantee anything because work is necessarily important and it's required when we're talking about guaranteeing someone's coaching program. And so I just want to get that out of the way. So now that we've kind of, we've kind of covered the book, but you mentioned something earlier that now kind of triggered my thought processes and moved me in a little bit of a different direction. You said that you essentially were Robert. And so that's where I came. That's why I just said Robert just a second ago. I yes, no, I, I, I like the comparison. I identify with the character. So no, 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 no issues with that. The wheels in my head were spinning. Patrick is Robert. Robert is Patrick. As I'm formulating <laughs> my next question. So let me ask you this, Patrick, whether you put it in the book or not, what's the biggest, most important lesson in business you've ever learned ever? So my dad, who I had the joy of being in business with him when I came out of business school, I had a couple of jobs and I joined the family furniture business. I never thought I was going to be in the family business. I was in it for five years. It's retail. And there's a lot of vicissitudes of being in retail. Economies go up, furniture sales will go up, economy goes down. Furniture is kind of a, an indicator of where the economy is. And you have some control, but there's a lot of things you don't control. My dad was really successful in his business because he focused on the things that he could control. He focused on the inputs. And he's alive today, he's a happy man because he didn't obsess over outcomes that didn't turn out the way he expected them to. Um, as business people, and this is great advice right now, we've all been dealt a hand. It may be good, it may be bad, uh, somewhere in between during COVID. We can't control the hand that we've been dealt in many ways because it's just the nature of our industry but we can control what we do. And in every single industry, there will be people who not only survive, but thrive. So if you just focus in on what can I do to thrive, and I don't have the answer for you because it's gonna vary from industry to industry, 
If you just focus in on the inputs and worry less about the outputs and you have quality inputs, you just have to trust that a process of quality inputs is going to come out with a quality output for you. That's good advice. That's good advice. Now, here's a question that I don't know that I've ever asked someone, but I wanted to... I'm always striving to make my podcast better and more valuable to the people who listen and certainly for my guests. I want my guests to have a, a really good experience as well. But what's something... I mean, you're a very successful guy. I mean, you can, you're all over the internet. You've got a, best, a truly best-selling book. I mean, go on Amazon, guys, and check it out. You'd be surprised in a good way. He's legit. What is, what's something that keeps a successful, happy, confident guy like you awake at night? Hmm. I want to make sure that when I die, <laughs> I want my eulogy and the message to be a very simple one. He left the world a better place for being in it. I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to, to live according to that, but I always feel like there's more that I can do to live up to that. And I spend a lot of time thinking about that. You know, I know when I have a good question, when the person I ask the question, they pause and they're like, hmm, or they say, that's a really good question. So that, that was a good answer. That was a very genuine, that was a good answer. So um, let me ask you this. Again, Robert is Patrick. Patrick, Patrick is Robert, or the genesis for my question. I want you to just take a couple of minutes and talk about a catastrophic, a catastrophic failure in business. What well, obviously catastrophic is one that was just devastating to you, or could have been devastating, but you managed to escape it or come back from it. Well, for me, there was uh, a situation in which, uh, when I entered my family's business, I was the MBA in marketing, and my dad was more of a finance guy. So I said, "Hey, Patrick, you take over all the marketing for the furniture business, and I'll just go with what you recommend." So I was handed the marketing budget, which at the time was $150,000. And basically, I had free reign to become a check writer. So I did. I was writing checks for all different sorts of marketing expenditures. And I remember being in my showroom next to my dad on a very slow Saturday. Most of your business in the furniture world happens on Saturday and Sundays. And he said, so uh, this is what $150,000 buys. And uh, that was kind of a running theme for a few months. I, I was successful in spending my annual marketing budget in six months, and I did not see a very strong return on investment. Actually, it brought in a few customers, but didn't justify the expense. So it was a real comeuppance that my supposed expertise was not working very well. So then that set me off on the journey that ultimately got me to write The Connector's Way, which was talking to people first friends in the furniture world, then joining a group of young entrepreneurs, asking questions about what was allowing them to be successful, where I was sort of missing the boat. And that's when I started hearing this thing about you know, how they treated their clients, how they built relationships. And that was not something that I was focused on whatsoever in my first year in the family business. So that was an aha moment for me. And it was very humbling. And it really got me to think, okay, if they can do it for what they're selling, whether it's a product or service, and I need to bring some of that into our business, that relationship building. So uh, I think we learn best through failure. That $150,000 was way more expensive than my MBA program, but honestly, a lot more valuable. I would venture to say, and I don't know you all that well, my gut feeling is that it was more disappointing to you and hurtful to you to let your dad down in that light than the 150. I mean, the 150 grand is still, that's, that's a boatload of cash, uh, especially to, and I've been there, done that uh, in my own <laughs> business. So the only person I have to like feel bad about or be mad at is me, but, um, disappointing your dad. I, I worked with my dad just to help him phase out of his business and sell their company. My dad's 82 now, but, um, I, I just imagine it was the disappointment of not coming through for your dad. That was probably weighing on you heavier than more heavily than, the fact that you just went through 150K. Oh, absolutely. The, the trust level he had, like he didn't, there was no question that I, I was going to make all the decisions and he wasn't going to micromanage me. It's like, I was the expert. I had gone to a good school. He had helped me pay for that school. So it was the trust that I had, that, that he, had, he had developed in me and what the disappointment was in terms of results that that trust generated on the, on, on, on the other side of it. So yeah, that, that was really tough. 
Yeah, the good news is that you got through it. So another question that I want to ask you, and now we're going to be like back to my list of questions that I had. We talked earlier about, yeah, there's a lot of people struggling, but there's also there's also some people that are actually doing pretty good right now. Some of them in very similar, if not the same industry. And so from an emotional, mental standpoint, how these people are approaching the challenges that we're all facing, again, due to no fault of our own, thank you, China. What's the thing about, what's the contrast? What's one thing that really surprises you most between the contrast between the people from an emotional, mental approach? how they're responding to the challenges versus like the people who are struggling versus the people that are really thriving. What's the one thing that really stands out from their mental, you kind of touched on it a minute ago. Hey, you know, if you're dealt bad cards, just keep moving forward, try to focus on the positive and deal with as much positivity as you can. But is there anything else that really stands out as far as, you know, is it resilience? What is it that's helping these people? Well, I, the first rule that the, the Robert learns in the connector's way is you've got to nurture body and mind to create positive energy and enthusiasm that attracts others. Easier to write a rule than to live by one. So in our last financial crisis back in 2008, 2010, uh, my company was not doing well. We were sort of collapsing. We had lost our major clients. We had a lot of marketing services that we offered. People cut mark outside marketing companies in times of crisis and recession. And I was not taking care of myself. And my wife, who works with me in our business, noticed this. She said, you know, you're sitting at your desk trying to send the ultimate email to bring a customer in, and that's not going to work for you. You need to get out there and start like engaging with the world. But I had stopped exercising because I thought it was all about email, all about the electronic stuff I should do. So I started exercising. That's when I started looking into doing things like keeping a gratitude journal, just things that would lift my own spirits up. Because if you're not in good relationship with yourself, you're not going to be able to build great relationships with others. So I think some people are just kind of pre-wired to look on the bright side. But the much bigger number of people need to do things to be able to focus on the bright side. And that's taking care of yourself, you know, eating right, exercising, um, gratitude journals, meditation, yoga, prayer. I mean, whatever it is, it's not the same, you know, recipe for everybody. But I think a lot of people neglect that and really at their detriment, because sometimes the person that's succeeding, the only difference is that person is really just coming from a much healthier spot. So I think that really taking care of yourself is a huge thing right now. Absolutely. I mean, mindset is everything. And if you're, like you mentioned, uh, fuel for your body, food can affect your mood, can affect your ability to concentrate, all of that, as well as exercise. And so invest in eating a good, balanced, healthy, organic I went vegan for two years. Now I'm slowly incorporating some organic meat back into their very limited amounts. But um, I feel so much better as a result of it. And I, I just, uh, I think, I think that's great advice. So just one last question, then we're going to kind of dive into to the things you're doing now and the, the way you're helping people. But Patrick, you've got, let me see here, I get the name of it right. You got the Connectors Way Cohort Coaching Program, which is geared towards the corporate side of your business. And then you have the online system, which is kind of a self-guided, I think you said there are like 52 videos and some training stuff and a person goes through at their own speed. So you've got these two amazing coaching programs. They're very different, but they're unbelievable. The reviews on these things are unbelievable. And then you've got a best-selling book. And so my question is, how does a guy create two entirely different types of coaching, two entirely different business settings, and at the same time, write a best-selling book that appeals to everyone on both sides of the fence that I just mentioned? Well, I, I think it's a struggle. And for someone who has a lot of ideas, it's a big struggle. So it really comes down to just prioritization. I, I have on LinkedIn today a post saying, you know, I won't be posting as much on social media between now and the end of the year because I need to finish the second book. I've got another book coming out, another business parable. So that's my one thing. I'm a big believer. I think the guys with the one thing Gary Keller, Jeff Woods, I mean, they're onto something with that. So it's really this relentless focus on what is important because there's so much extraneous that is like the shiny mirrors out there. So you need to turn away from that and just focus on the core things. You've identified some things that I've done, but I think there's so many things that I could have done instead of those things. So I think it's really saying, okay, where do I want to go? Start with the end in mind, as John Maxwell said, and what are going to be those things that are going to get me to that end? And 
it allows you to then decide what not to do, which I think is super important. Um, in terms of creating things, it's really cool if you can create one thing and kind of multi-purpose it. So the Connectors Way is a parable. The Connectors Way online system is the how to be a successful Robert. And those are videos, online activities, worksheets, things that you can do. The videos then dovetail into our coaching program. Our enterprises hire us, but all of the individuals in our coaching program have access to the videos. So it's so create something. And so many people want to create something new, something new, something new. And I think there's so much power into really going in deep with what your core is. And there's a lot of coaches out there, but we focus just on relationship building. We're not doing leadership coaching. We're not doing you know, uh, product strategy coaching. No. Like, so pick your lane. And once you pick your lane and you say, okay, this is where I, I want to be, then I think it's going to enable you to make decisions of what not to do. And then all of a sudden, once you know what, you're, what you are going to do, you can focus in on a handful of things and do them well. That's really good advice. That's awesome advice. What are you going to be doing five years from now? Five years from now, our, our end goal is 10 years from now. So our end is in 10 years, we want to have a company, the Galvanizing Group, be something that a large consulting company wants to buy as, hey, when it comes to business relationship building, why build a practice area when we can just acquire someone with a great client roster, somebody with some unique IP? Um, instead of just trying to reinvent the wheel. So five years will be halfway to our 10-year goal. So it's going to be more IP, more big name clients, more expertise about relationship building because we are continuous learners in, that, in this field and uh, just, a, just, a, just a bigger, bigger scale business. But what we talk about relationship building isn't going away. Connectors Way came out in China last month. So maybe we're going to be doing awesome. some more international stuff because what we're, what we're talking about is not an American thing. It's a human thing. And we've got a lot of humans out there that we can serve. You know, we mentioned uh, Cialdini, Dr. Bob, earlier in the discussion. And you just hit the nail on the head. Human behavior is human behavior. Yes, there are cultural differences between us. But human behavior is still human behavior. No matter what you do, it's human behavior. And so let me ask you this, Patrick. And then we'll one, one last question. And then we're going to talk about more detail about how people can find out more about you and so on and so forth. Give you an opportunity to um, talk about your things for a second. But what's the one question today that I didn't ask that I should have asked, whether it's about the book or about you or your business personally? So so one question that um, I've been asked a lot, so it's not saying that, that you should have asked this, but the one that I'm getting a lot is like, you know, Patrick, you wrote this book, The Connector's Way. You're telling people they need to go out and connect in the world. Is it relevant in this COVID age that we're in? And I would say it's absolutely relevant. And to say that you can't connect and be building relationships now because you can't meet with people in the real world is a cop out. You absolutely can build relationships. If you're thinking about how you're going to serve others, you can go online, you can write recommendations on LinkedIn for them, you can write reviews for their business, you can meet with them, show some empathy and try to figure out ways you can be of service to people if they're homeschooling or whatever their needs are. There's so many things that you can do that are more necessary than ever. So connecting and relationship building, there's no pandemic past that you don't need to focus on it because it's just too difficult. No, this is an opportunity and good news. A lot of people aren't focusing in on it. So if you do, you're going to be one step ahead or many steps ahead of your competitors. You know, you bring up another great point. I learned it from Gary Halbert years and years ago before he died. He talked about gun to the head copywriting. And so with uh, with Hannah, the champ, my 16 year old, before COVID, we were traveling all over the country. We're playing elite level soccer, playing teams like that are best, the best of the best of the best uh, for her age group from all over the country. And when we would train, I mean, I would literally drive the car next to her. She'd be running. I played Rocky on my iPhone out the window. And awesome. she, she didn't really know what that was. But uh, <laughs> then I showed her. And then I said, Hannah, pretend that someone has a gun to my head or someone has a gun to your mom's head or your best friend's head. And you have to make this last hill without walking. Could you do it? And that would spark her on. And so you bring up a good point. People saying it can't be done because we're in COVID. Listen, if you have children or a spouse or a best friend or parents or whatever, imagine somebody holding a gun to their head and saying, listen, if you don't go out and make one connection today, whether it's through Zoom, on LinkedIn or whatever else, we're going to pull the trigger. <laughs> how easily do you think it's kind of silly, but at the same time, yeah. how, how quickly and how easily do you think you could go make that connection? 
So really it comes down to, is your why big enough? And you brought that out earlier. So he's giving you phenomenal advice. If your why is big enough, you can do it. it I mean, there's a sign over my shoulder. It says you can do it. Yep. If you really want it, you're going to have failure, but you're also going to have success. Patrick, how can we find out more about you, what you're doing? Tell us about your book, your coaching programs, your website, URL. What do we need to know? The easiest way to find all that stuff is just to go to the connectorsway.com. That's just as it sounds. It's the name of the book. It's the name of the coaching program. It's the name of the online virtual system that we have. Keeping things as simple as we can. So just go there. And uh, if you have any questions, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to answer them. And uh, I think this is just a great time. You, yes, you can go out and get clients now uh, with, <laughs> with the right mindset. Uh, and I think your, your podcast just I, I love it because it's turning people on to that on a continuous basis. People need to be reminded of it. Yeah, I wish I was smart enough to know all this stuff myself, but I'm not. So I invite, I do the next best thing is to bring people on who are much smarter than me in all these different areas. Uh, and, it, you know, it's for me, it's been a, you talk about your MBA. My podcast has literally been like an MBA for me because of all of the different people that I get to talk to and they share what's working and so on and so forth and the friendships I've made. So uh, thanks for being on the show today. I know that the, everyone who's listening to the show today, that individual man or woman, professional dentist, small business owner, marketer, whoever they are, they got a lot out of today's show. And I just want to thank you for that because you did a fabulous job. Is there anything else you want to add before we wrap? Thanks a ton, Ken. Uh, this is the best day you've been given to build relationships. So go out there and build them. Awesome. We'll talk to you soon, Patrick. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye. I hope you appreciate that whether or not you've been connecting with prospects and doing sales presentations virtually isn't really what you want to focus on. Understanding how to build your business one relationship at a time and knowing how to do it virtually, successfully and repeatedly so you can get clients now is your goal. Being able to grow your business and make it more profitable is all about being able to utilize the right strategies and tactics in order to consistently and profitably attract new clients. And we can benefit greatly from understanding and deploying virtual networking, and sales methodologies like we covered today. In spite of the setbacks and hardships the COVID-19 crisis has caused for you and other business owners, it's exciting to know that opportunities and solutions have emerged in the world of attracting prospects and making sales virtually. And you heard a number of them in this conversation. If today's episode has gotten you thinking about ways you can deploy and benefit from connecting with prospects, building relationships, and generating sales virtually, I want to quickly mention several past episodes that are a great complement to this conversation. The first one that comes to mind is episode 373, The Ultimate Guide for Winning Virtual Sales Presentations, The Rise Framework, the virtual selling system that works even better in a bad economy. And that's with me, your host, Ken Newhouse. This episode was one of the few that I do solo, and I did the episode because I felt an obligation, in fact, to share the framework that I've used to build an amazing consulting and coaching business as well as build the top-ranked show on iTunes that teaches you how to get clients now, as we talked about in today's conversation. And so much of what I talked about on episode 373 works in concert, works beautifully with the strategies you heard today in my conversation with Patrick Galvin, including the myth that's permeating many of the Facebook groups and chat groups online, that because of COVID, virtually no one is spending money, or another one is, that it's virtually impossible to sell your products and services unless you can meet your prospects in person. Certainly, there are a lot of products and services that have been in the past exclusively sold in face-to-face -face meetings with prospects and clients. But quite honestly, when you look at the research, the growing trend for most B2B businesses is that they have successfully transitioned into the process of reaching out to prospects, scheduling presentations, and making sales virtually. And they're doing it in a proven, predictable manner. And episode 373 is a great complement to today's conversation. I'd also recommend episode 368, the communication secrets to get from good to great that will help you stand out in the marketplace, get clients now, and make your business more profitable with Carmen Gallo, author of Talk Like Ted and Five Stars, an amazingly successful entrepreneur and author in his own right. In episode 368, Gallo reveals a formula for persuasion that works especially well when used in virtual selling to inspire prospects and clients to take the actions you want them to take. As the nature of the work changes and technology carries things across the globe in a moment, communication skills become more valuable, not less. 
So episode 368 is for that. And then finally, I couldn't talk about persuasive selling skills you can and should be using, especially in virtual settings, without mentioning the work of Dr. Jonah Berger on episode 366. Is it ethical to use persuasion methods this powerful in business? In this episode, Berger reveals persuasion methods you can use to increase the effectiveness of your virtual meetings and sales presentations, as I talked about in today's conversation. Episode 366, a great compliment to this as well. All of those past episodes you can find on our website at www.kennewhouse.com. And before wrapping up, I want to quickly mention that we're in the process of creating a free membership for you where you're going to be able to access the entire library of conversations searchable by topic since 2017. When you become a member on kennewhouse.com, you'll have instant access to my personal library, the book notes, and the highlights I've captured from Patrick Galvin's book, The Connector's Way. You'll also have access to the other books and authors that I've featured on the show over the last few years, plus access to a weekly strategy guide that will come in your email inbox every Wednesday. The guide will feature all the links we've mentioned on every show that links to books, resources, also other podcast episodes, as well as the most effective strategy we covered on that week's episode. Additionally, the guide will contain other articles and resources that I found online that I think will certainly be helpful to you in your business. So be sure to be on the lookout for the announcement where we're going to be launching the new free membership portal that we're creating for you on www.kennewhouse.com. And in addition to all that I've mentioned, the first 500 subscribers will get a free digital copy of the updated version of my book, Profitable Again, as well as a copy of my newest book, Profitable Podcast Blueprint. It's the first book in a three-part series. Speaking of world-class marketing and sales strategist, Kate Colbert is my guest next week. Colbert is the author of Think Like a Marketer, How a Shift in Mindset Can Change Everything for Your Business, a book that sold tens of thousands of copies with 100% of the book's reviews being five stars, which is impressive. Colbert is a highly regarded marketing strategist with 20 years of communications leadership inside and outside organizations. She's an accomplished marketer and professional writer who has spent her career telling brand stories that help individuals and corporations communicate their way to profitable growth. So be sure that you're listening to the conversation that we have next week with Kate Colbert. All right, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. Have a good week, and I'll see you on Monday. Take care. Bye-bye. Our objective with this podcast is to help you and your business stand out in the marketplace by crystallizing your messaging, marketing, and communications. On behalf of the whole Ken Newhouse team, thanks for listening.